Hi folks, I'm Leon Little and I'm Owl About Stories. I read them, write them, watch them, anything with a story, I absolutely love it. I especially love sharing them with other people and what better way is there to start than with the classics? They're classics for a reason, right? They're amazing stories and absolutely timeless. Don't forget to hit up all those fancy buttons. Like, subscribe, follow, share, whatever you need to do. But most importantly, don't be afraid to reach out. I'd love to connect with you, so feel free to leave comments as you'd like, or you can even follow me over on my Buy Me A Coffee page, leannelittle.com, to message directly. So let's continue on with The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 88. The Insult. At the banker's door, Bouchamp stopped Morsif. Listen, said he. Just now I told you it was of Monsieur de Monte Cristo you must demand an explanation. Yes, and we are going to his house. Reflect, Morsif, one moment before you go. On what shall I reflect? On the importance of the step you are taking. Is it more serious than going to Monsieur Danglars? Yes, Monsieur Danglars is a money lover, and those who love money, you know, think too much of what they risk to be easily induced to fight a duel. The other is, on the contrary, to all appearance a true nobleman. But do you not fear to find him a bully? I only fear one thing, namely, to find a man who will not fight. Do not be alarmed, said Bouchamp. He will meet you. My only fear is that he will be too strong for you. My friend, said Morsif with a sweet smile, that is what I wish. The happiest thing that could occur to me would be to die in my father's stead. That would save us all. Your mother would die of grief. My poor mother, said Albert, passing his hand across his eyes. I know she would, but better so than die of shame. Are you quite decided, Albert? Yes, let us go. But do you not think we shall find the Count at home? He intended returning some hours after me, and doubtless he is now at home. They ordered the driver to take them to number 30 champs Elysees. Bouchamp wished to go alone, but Albert observed that as this was an unusual circumstance, he might be allowed to deviate from the usual etiquette of duels. The cause which the young man espoused was one so sacred that Bouchamp had only to comply with all his wishes. He yielded and contented himself with following Morsif. Albert sprang from the porter's lodge to the steps. He was received by Baptistin. The Count had indeed just arrived, but he was in his bath and had forbidden that anyone should be admitted. But after his bath, asked Morsif, my master will go to dinner. And after dinner, he will sleep for an hour. Then, he is going to the opera. Are you sure of it? asked Albert. Quite, sir. My master has ordered his horses at eight o'clock precisely. Very good, replied Albert. That is all I wish to know. Then turning towards Bouchamp, if you have anything to attend to, Bouchamp, do it directly. If you have any appointment for this evening, defer it till tomorrow. I depend on you to accompany me to the opera, and, if you can, bring Chateau Renaud with you. Bouchamp availed himself of Albert's permission and left him, promising to call for him at quarter before eight. On his return home, Albert expressed his wish to Franz Debray and Morel to see them at the opera that evening. Then he went to see his mother, who, since the events of the day before, had refused to see anyone and had kept her room. He found her in bed, overwhelmed with grief at this public humiliation. The sight of Albert produced the effect which might naturally be expected on Mercedes. She pressed her son's hand and sobbed aloud, but her tears relieved her. Albert stood one moment speechless by the side of his mother's bed. It was evident from his pale face and knit brows that his resolution to revenge himself was growing weaker. "'My dear mother,' said he, "'do you know if Monsieur de Morsif has any enemy?' Mercedes started. She noticed that the young man did not say my father. "'My son,' she said, "'persons in the Count's situation have many secret enemies. Those who are known are not the most dangerous. I know it and appeal to your penetration.' You are of so superior a mind, nothing escapes you. Why do you say so? Because, for instance, you noticed on the evening of the ball we gave that Monsieur de Monte Cristo would eat nothing in our house. Mercedes raised herself on her feverish arm. Monsieur de Monte Cristo, she exclaimed, and how is he connected with the question you asked me? You know, mother, Monsieur de Monte Cristo is almost an oriental and it is customary with Orientals to secure full liberty for revenge by not eating or drinking in the houses of their enemies. 
Do you say Monsieur de Monte Cristo is our enemy? replied Mercedes, becoming paler than the sheet which covered her. Who told you so? Why, you are mad, Albert. Monsieur de Monte Cristo has only shown us kindness. Monsieur de Monte Cristo saved your life. You yourself presented him to us. Oh, I entreat you, my son, if you had entertained such an idea, to spell it. And my counsel to you, nay, my prayer, is to retain his friendship. Mother, replied the young man, you have special reasons for telling me to conciliate that man. I, said Mercedes, blushing as rapidly as she had turned pale, and again becoming paler than ever. Yes, doubtless. And is it not that he may never do us any harm? Mercedes shuddered, and fixing on her son a scrutinizing gaze. You speak strangely, said she to Albert, and you appear to have some singular prejudices. What has the Count done? Three days since you were with him in Normandy, only three days since we looked on him as our best friend. An ironical smile passed over Albert's lips. Mercedes saw it, and with the double instinct of a woman and mother guessed all. But as she was prudent and strong-minded, she concealed both her sorrows and her fears. Albert was silent, an instant after the Countess resumed. You came to inquire after my health. I will candidly acknowledge that I am not well. You should install yourself here and cheer my solitude. I do not wish to be left alone. Mother, said the young man, you know how gladly I would obey your wish, but an urgent and important affair obliges me to leave you for the whole evening. Well, replied Mercedes, sighing, go, Albert, I will not make you a slave to your filial piety. Albert pretended he did not hear, bowed to his mother and quitted her. Scarcely had he shut her door when Mercedes called a confidential servant and ordered him to follow Albert wherever he should go that evening, and to come and tell her immediately what he observed. Then she rang for her lady's maid, and weak as she was, she dressed in order to be ready for whatever might happen. The footman's mission was an easy one. Albert went to his room and dressed with unusual care. At ten minutes to eight, Bouchamp arrived. He had seen Chateau Renaud, who promised to be in the orchestra before the curtain was raised. Both got into Albert's coupé, and as the young man had no reason to conceal where he was going, he called aloud, To the opera! In his impatience, he arrived before the beginning of the performance. Chateau Renaud was at his post, apprised by Bouchamp of the circumstances. He required no explanation from Albert. The conduct of the son in seeking to avenge his father was so natural that Chateau Renaud did not seek to dissuade him, and was content with renewing his assurances of devotion. Debray was not yet come but Albert knew that he seldom lost a scene at the opera. Albert wandered about the theatre until the curtain was drawn up. He hoped to meet with Monsieur de Monte Cristo, either in the lobby or on the stairs. The bell summoned him to a seat, and he entered the orchestra with Chateau Renaud and Bouchamp. But his eyes scarcely quitted the box between the columns, which remained obstinately closed during the whole of the first act. At last, as Albert was looking at his watch for about the hundredth time, at the beginning of the second act, the door opened, and Monte Cristo entered, dressed in black and leaning over the front of the box, looked round the pit. Morel followed him, and looked also for his sister and brother-in-law. He soon discovered them in another box and kissed his hand to them. The Count, in his survey of the pit, encountered a pale face and threatening eyes, which evidently sought to gain his attention. He recognized Albert, but thought it better not to notice him as he looked so angry and discomposed. Without communicating his thoughts to his companion, he sat down, drew out his opera glass, and looked another way. Although apparently not noticing Albert, he did not, however, lose sight of him. And when the curtain fell at the end of the second act, he saw him leave the orchestra with his two friends. Then his head was seen passing at the back of the boxes, and the Count knew that the approaching storm was intended to fall on him. He was at that moment conversing cheerfully with Morel, but he was well prepared for what might happen. The door opened, and Monte Cristo, turning round, saw Albert, pale and trembling, followed by Bouchamp and Chateau Renaud. Well, cried he, with that benevolent politeness which distinguished his salutation from the common civilities of the world, my cavalier has attained his object. Good evening, Monsieur de Morcerf. The countenance of this man, who possessed such extraordinary control over his feelings, expressed the most perfect cordiality. Morel only then recollected the letter he had received from the Viscount, in which, without assigning any reason, he begged him to go to the opera. 
but he understood that something terrible was brewing. We are not come here, sir, to exchange hypocritical expressions of politeness or false professions of friendship, said Albert, but to demand an explanation. The young man's trembling voice was scarcely audible. An explanation at the opera, said the Count, with that calm tone and penetrating eye which characterized the man who knows his cause is good. Little acquainted as I am with the habits of Parisians, I should not have thought this the place for such a demand. Still, if people will shut themselves up, said Albert, and cannot be seen because they are bathing, dining, or asleep, we must avail ourselves of the opportunity whenever they are to be seen. I am not difficult of access, sir, for yesterday, if my memory does not deceive me, you were at my house. Yesterday I was at your house, sir, said the young man, because then I knew not who you were. In pronouncing these words, Albert had raised his voice so as to be heard by those in the adjoining boxes and in the lobby. Thus the attention of many was attracted by this altercation. "'Where are you come from, sir?' said Monte Cristo. "'You do not appear to be in the possession of your senses. "'Provided I understand your perfidy, sir, and succeed in making you understand that I will be revenged, "'I shall be reasonable enough,' said Albert furiously." I do not understand you, sir, replied Monte Cristo. And if I did, your tone is too high. I am at home here, and I alone have a right to raise my voice above another's. Leave the box, sir. Monte Cristo pointed towards the door with the most commanding dignity. Ah, I shall know how to make you leave your home, replied Albert, clasping in his convulsed grasp the glove which Monte Cristo did not lose sight of. Well, well, said Monte Cristo quietly. I see you wish to quarrel with me, but I would give you one piece of advice, which you will do well to keep in mind. It is in poor taste to make a display of a challenge. Display is not becoming to everyone, Monsieur de Morcif. At this name, a murmur of astonishment passed round the group of spectators of the scene. They had talked of no one but Morcif the whole day. Albert understood the illusion in a moment, and was about to throw his glove at the Count, when Morel seized his hand, while Bouchamp and Chateau Renaud, fearing the scene would surpass the limits of a challenge, held him back. But Monte Cristo, without rising and leaning forward in his chair, merely stretched out his arm and taking the damp, crushed glove from the clenched hand of the young man. Sir, said he in a solemn tone, I consider your glove thrown and will return it to you wrapped around a bullet. Now leave me or I will summon my servants to throw you out at the door. Wild, almost unconscious, and with eyes inflamed, Albert stepped back and Morel closed the door. Monte Cristo took up his glass again as if nothing had happened. His face was like marble, and his heart was like bronze. Morel whispered, What have you done to him? I? Nothing. At least not personally, said Monte Cristo. But there must be some cause for the strange scene. The Count of Morcif's adventure exasperates the young man. Have you anything to do with it? It was through Heyday that the chamber was informed of his father's treason. Indeed, said Morel. I have been told, but would not credit it, that the Grecian slave I have seen with you here in this very box was the daughter of Ali Pasha. It is true, nevertheless. Then, said Morel, I understand it all, and the scene was premeditated. How so? Yes, Albert wrote to request me to come to the opera, doubtless that I might be a witness to the insult he meant to offer you. Probably, said Monte Cristo with his imperturbable tranquility. But what shall you do with him? With whom? With Albert. What shall I do with Albert? As certainly, Maximilian, as I now press your hand, I shall kill him before ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Morel, in his turn, took Monte Cristo's hand in both of his, and he shuddered to feel how cold and steady it was. Ah, Count, said he, his father loves him so much. Don't speak of me of that said Monte Cristo with the first movement of anger he had betrayed. I will make him suffer. Morel, amazed, let fall Monte Cristo's hand. Count, count, said he. Dear Maximilian, interrupted the count, listen how adorably Dupre is singing in that line. O oh, Mathilde, idole de Manam. I was the first to discover Dupre at Naples and the first to applaud him. Bravo, bravo! Morel saw it was useless to say more and refrained. The curtain, which had risen at the close of the scene with Albert, again fell, and a rap was heard at the door. "'Come in,' said Monte Cristo with a voice that betrayed not the least emotion, and immediately Bouchamp appeared. 
Good evening, Monsieur Bouchamp, said Monte Cristo, as if this was the first time he had seen the journalist that evening. Be seated. Bouchamp bowed and sitting down. Sir, said he, I just now accompanied Monsieur de Morcerf, as you saw. And that means, replied Monte Cristo, laughing, that you had probably just dined together. I am happy to see, Monsieur Bouchamp, that you are more sober than he was. Sir, said Monsieur Bouchamp, Albert was wrong, I acknowledge, to betray so much anger, and I come on my own account to apologize for him. And having done so entirely on my own account, be it understood, I would add that I believe you too gentlemanly to refuse giving him some explanation concerning your connection with Yanina. Then I will add two words about the young Greek girl. Monte Cristo motioned for him to be silent. Come, said he laughing. There are all my hopes about to be destroyed. How so? asked Bouchamp. Doubtless you wish to make me appear a very eccentric character. I am, in your opinion, a Lara, a Manfred, a Lord Ruthven. Then, just as I am arriving at the climax, you defeat your own end and seek to make an ordinary man of me. You bring me down to your own level and demand explanations. Indeed, Monsieur Bouchamp, it is quite laughable. Yet, replied Bouchamp haughtily, there are occasions when probity commands. Monsieur Bouchamp, interposed the strange man, the Count of Monte Cristo bows to none but the Count of Monte Cristo himself. Say no more, I entreat you. I do what I please, Monsieur Bouchamp, and it is always well done. Sir, replied the young man, honest men are not to be paid with such coin. I require honorable guarantees. I am, sir, a living guarantee, replied Monte Cristo motionless, but with a threatening look. We have both blood in our veins which we wish to shed. That is our mutual guarantee. Tell the Viscount so, and that tomorrow, before ten o'clock, I shall see what color his is. Then I have only to make arrangements for the duel, said Bouchamp. It is quite immaterial to me, said Monte Cristo, and it was very unnecessary to disturb me at the opera for such a trifle. In France, people fight with a sword or pistol, in the colonies with a carbine, in Arabia with a dagger. Tell your client that, although I am the insulted party, in order to carry out my eccentricity, I leave him the choice of arms, and will accept without discussion, without dispute, anything, even combat by drawing lots, which is always stupid, but with me different from other people, as I am sure to gain. Sure to gain, repeated Bouchamp, looking with amazement at the Count. Certainly, said Monte Cristo, slightly shrugging his shoulders. Otherwise, I would not fight with Monsieur de Morcerf. I shall kill him, I cannot help it. Only by a single line this evening at my house, let me know the arms and the hour. I do not like to be kept waiting. Pistols, then, at eight o'clock in the Bois de Vincennes, said Bouchamp, quite disconcerted, not knowing if he was dealing with an arrogant brigadaccio or supernatural being. Very well, sir, said Monte Cristo. Now all that is settled, do let me see the performance and tell your friend Albert not to come any more this evening. He will hurt himself with all his ill-chosen barbarisms. Let him go home and go to sleep. Bouchamp left the box, perfectly amazed. Now, said Monte Cristo, turning towards Morel, I may depend upon you, may I not? Certainly, said Morel. I am at your service, Count. Still, what? It is desirable I should know the real cause. That is to say, you would rather not. No. The young man is acting blindfolded and knows not the true cause, which is known only to God and to me. But I give you my word, Morel, the God who does knows it will be on our side. Enough, said Morel. Who is your second witness? I know no one in Paris, Morel, on whom I could confer that honor besides you and your brother Emmanuel. Do you think Emmanuel would oblige me? I will answer for him, Count. Well, that is all I require. Tomorrow morning at seven o'clock you will be with me, will you not? We will. Hush, the curtain is rising. Listen. I never lose a note of this opera if I can avoid it. The music of William Tell is so sweet. So that's it for this chapter. And again, take a minute to like, subscribe, and share. And don't forget that I love hearing from all of you. So please leave any comments you'd like, or you can follow me over on my Buy Me a Coffee page, leannelittle.com. That's L-I-A-N-E-L-I-T-T-L-E dot -E com. And thank you so much for listening. Remember, it's Owl About the Story. Have a great day.